Hello again and welcome to Inside Story, the API's magazine program and your one-stop source for what's taking place in your country and your community. I am Nadia Slater. This week, why is it so hot as temperatures soar and impact our lives in ways we never thought possible? The reparations movement is gaining momentum. What does this mean for us? We chat with St. Vincent Grenadine's Chairman of Reparations Committee, Jomo Thomas. Christmas traditions revisited from caroling to nine mornings. And on Community Beat, we explore rare talent. This informative presentation begins right now. Marine and Coastal Rehabilitation Adaptation Project. Located south of the island, extending to over five bays, White Sands, Kanash, Kaliakwa, Villa, and Indian Bay. Let's improve aquatic life. A message from the National Parks, Rivers, and Beaches Authority and partners. Welcome back. Climate change is a global phenomenon. Its impact has begun to wreak havoc on small, vulnerable states like St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It can be felt in almost every sphere of life, none more so than the heat. And we keep asking ourselves, why is it so hot? It would seem that the weather has gone crazy. Torrential rains in the dry season and heat waves in the hurricane season. No longer can a farmer rely on his innate knowledge of weather patterns over the years. Even the weatherman gets it wrong more often than not. All this because of the phenomenon of climate change. The leaders in the climate change agenda and the climate change issue so far has been the small island states, the Caribbean, the Pacific, because we are the ones who are really taking the brunt of the assault. So climate change is in fact a reality, and it's with us, and it's beating us hard. And we have had a few events outside of the normal rainy period or outside of the normal hurricane season. And with climate change, as you know, we are either going to have more frequent events, more intense events, or lack of rainfall there. So it's, it's either more rainfall, less rainfall, and the intensity is, is going to increase. And we have seen that. Unusual weather phenomenon from the period 2010 to 2016 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines has removed any doubt that climate change and its effects are real and dangerous. The April floods we, where we had uh, that was almost an extreme event, maybe a one in a hundred year um, flood event that occurred mainly in the Georgetown area. Thankfully, we did not have any lives that were lost then. But we, it was a traditional dry period, intense heavy rain from a trough system that really impacted St. Vincent and the Grenadines and over 100, about a hundred million dollars worth in damage um, on that part of the country. Infrastructure, homes were damaged, persons displaced. Then we would have had the December 2013 floods, but even before that, around that time also, 2010, we had Tomas. Hurricane Tomas, but before Tomas, we had one of the worst droughts ever um, for St. Vincent and Grenadines, the 2009-2010 event. And then on 2010 also had some records, one of the driest year and one of the rainiest year, the rainiest year on record in 2010, according to the data from the Met Office. So there we're seeing the extremes from the dry to the to the extreme event and that also has implications for the impact on the soil, impact on the vegetation, impact on erosion and how quickly the, the land will erode and how quickly we'll have um, a flood event. Then we would have had the, one of our most extreme events in recent times, the 2013 floods where we had a loss of lives, we had intense rainfall outside of the traditional hurricane period. So those impacts over the years and they have been adding up and then we have had several small events in November 2016 heavy rainfall. As a matter of fact, the whole month of November, well, I think it was the second or third rainiest month ever um, on record for the entire month, and that month alone was almost $200 million damage. In fact, the cost keeps adding up. Hurricane Thomas amounted to $120 million EC dollars in damage. The April 2011 floods, EC $100 million. December 2013 floods, $330 million more than 17% of this country's GDP. 
November 2016, $197 million. The cost is not limited to monies, but human lives as well. These events resulted in a total of 14 deaths and the loss of homes and property. The impact of climate change affects every aspect of small island living and economy. Its impact on the forest, um, it changes in terms of the fruiting um, of the trees, so it affects the biodiversity and the way the animals work within the forest. Also, the, the flooding can cause massive erosion of um, areas and because of our fragile nature of our country, young soils, steep slopes, there can be a lot of um, <laughs> erosion of these um, um, steep slope areas. But our main concern as it comes to climate change is the impact both on human activities in terms of what we do that, that um, increases climate change, that is increases the global temperature and also what we do to our environment. In the planning now, the planning is all year round now. It's not about the hurricane season. And many persons think we only work during the hurricane season. That's far from the truth because we have other hazards and threats that can impact civil and the Grandines. But now with climate change, you're not sure what, you know, a, a dry season. I, I say, personally, I say it's either we're in a, either sunshine or rain. I don't like the word wet season or dry season anymore because what we're realizing that anything can happen in um, any of these events. Uh, um, so our planning has to constantly be changing and adapting and adjusting to the, to, the, to the changing times also. And we have, if in our plans now, we are looking at more addressing severe weather events, not just a say a tropical storm or, tro or hurricane, um, because now you're having more severe events that you need to have clear procedures for addressing. It may not necessarily even be a, a flood, but you know you have these severe events coming. Some of the more visual effects of climate change has been coastal erosion. This beach in Clare Valley used to be filled with sand dunes. You couldn't see one end of the beach to another. Today, sea level rise and coastal erosion are evident. Well, we're seeing a lot of coastal erosion, especially on the northeastern side of the Sandy Bay Orange Hill area. There's a lot of coastal erosion in that area. Now, the entire island is facing the impact. It's a small island, so there's not much protection. But the entire island is being hit by coastal erosion. It's most uh, in the area where it's exposed to the Atlantic greatest. Our removal of coastal, important coastal vegetation also can have that impact because we have forests from the coast right up to the mountain top. We have the mangrove forests, which are very important ecosystems, but we have been ignoring them in early times. We will use them as dump sites or we will cut them down for the development. We're now realizing the importance of protecting the coastline. Um, in terms of our interior forests, when we damage that, we infect, um, affect our, our water source. Um, islands, small islands like us in St. Uh, Vincent and the Grenadines, we have this sort of a rich, rich reef approach in terms of our ecosystems. So anything you, that you impact at the rich time, it affects all the way down to the reef. So in terms of the impact of climate change is what we need to do we, to build resilience in our forests to cope with the extremes in terms of the weather systems that will come due to climate change. There's also the issue of the landslides we are seeing frequently. Part of it has to do with our own development style. We cut a lot of roads into areas where the land is very, the topsoil is very deep and there's no retaining structures. We cut them sometimes vertical and so when the rain comes there's nothing to hold back the land. The water soaks into the soil, the soil becomes heavy, it moves downhill. So in opening up lands in the interior and in other areas for housing or for agriculture, we are in, invariably opening up channels for water to flow. The forests and watershed also suffer from changes in temperatures. This is slowly threatening the food security of small nations like ours. So one of the things is to reduce our impact, our negative impact on the forest because it affects us all throughout from water, from biodiversity to the air, the air that we breathe. It, um, what we do to the forest damages that and it, it, it affects so many cycles. And the forest is a very important um, um, resource in terms of climate change also in that the forest acts as a store, a stockhouse for carbon. 
carbon is one of the main carbon dioxide is one of the main greenhouse gases and car the forest helps to store that carbon in the leaves and the trunks and the roots of the trees so it holds the soil it holds the, the carbon in the soil also the holds the carbon in the tree so um, it reduces the amount of carbon in the air which is one of the greenhouse gases that increases the global temperatures so our forest plays a multiplicity of roles in terms of um, reducing the impact of climate change, helping to mitigate climate change and also being resilient against climate change. It's a pick now agriculture, the production, because we're having change in crop. I remember two, three years ago, like all the pear trees and the orange trees were confused. All the fruits were beginning to form and then fall off. So one year we virtually had no pear and no oranges locally, it just fell off. It was a matter of their adjusting to rapid change in temperature, temperature. in rainfall in a short space of time. So even the plants themselves are having some difficulty adjusting. So we are affecting our agriculture. Also, the, the yields because the amount of water available in the soil for agriculture. If you don't have irrigation to support even bananas, for example, your production falls. And if the bananas don't get the right amount of water, the, the fingers, the grains become small and curved up. Mm. Uh, at one point, I remember when we were exporting bananas, they were beginning to say they want straight bananas, <laughs> and you know the problems. So the climate change is impacting our agriculture, it's impacting our tourism. Coral bleaching is another issue. This disrupts the marine ecosystem, reduces the food supply for fishes, and forces initiatives such as FADS or fish aggregating devices so that fish can reproduce. We have impacts such as um, the, the problem on the fisheries resource as well. Fish also migrates based on ocean temperatures. So when the ocean temperatures in these areas are that high, the fish that will come down north don't come as far south again as they did or as they used to because it's much warmer up there. So the temperatures result in a change in our fisheries. And the impact doesn't stop there. There's a growing body of research which suggests that growing temperatures will result in low resistance for certain crops, forcing diets to change with a heavy reliance on processed food. Though this may appear far-fetched, the average retention's diet has changed over the past 20 years, with a heavier risk of cancers and chronic non-communicable diseases. Because of the change in um, crop yields, we are growing different crops now. And we're also going for more of these genetically modified crops. Whether we like it or not, the agriculturists are saying, you know, we cannot feed our world population growing food naturally the way we do. We have to now add more chemicals or we have to go for genetically modified plants. And some species of plants, some varieties, the local ones that we were accustomed to, seem to be phasing out because they're looking for high yields. So in changing the crop, we're also changing the diet of people. Changing the diet of people. The diet didn't just emerge, so it actually evolved with the people over time in the condition where they live. So when you change the diet you change, and you change the climate, you're going to have a lot of complications. And, well, in terms of the heat effects on humans, that, that's another very important area, particularly for elderly persons and children and those who are prone to the, um, things like asthma or migraines. Mm -hmm. They are really feeling the impacts of the increased temperatures. Okay. What does this mean for us? Because it means it's affecting um, our economy. Climate change is a serious issue for small island states. It affects our tourism, for example. What we understand from climate change is that it's getting warmer in our parts of the world. And it's getting hot, in fact. And in the north, it's getting warmer. So the people who will run from the coal don't have to come all the way to the Caribbean. In fact, coming to the Caribbean now is like running to the heat. So they prefer to stay a little further north. It's so, yes, the, the, what used to be cold is now warm. So they don't have to come to what used to be warm, which is now hot. So we have a decline in our tourism arrivals in this part of the world due to that. So what is the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines doing to mitigate the impact of climate change? So far, they have imposed restrictions on sand mining on public beaches so that the beaches can replenish themselves restrictions on catching certain types of fish so that species can replenish and the climate change levy bill all of this seems rather overwhelming you know what can we do it seems, it seems ah. as though we're just a small island and all this host of things coming upon us and we, we almost seem helpless that's that's the point true the helpless part is what we don't, we, we don't accept. I remember the Prime Minister said we don't accept this helplessness. We, we need to go after it more aggressively and so that we can 
address the issue. The reality is that if we sit back and complain, it's going to get worse. We have to address. And that's one of the things I applaud the small island states for when they go to a conference of parties. They actually lobby and fight these developed countries to adjust the, climate, uh, the, the carbon dioxide emissions. One of the things the climate change conference attempts to do is to get the countries to set what they call targets. How much carbon are you going to emit into the atmosphere from your industries or from your vehicular traffic and whatever. So you're trying to get countries to reduce. And so far, records have shown that about 57 countries in the world have actually reduced their carbon emissions to a level that is acceptable. But the main emitters still have not done anything. They're the ones who have refused to sign on to the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol Kyoto. that tries to limit that. And the main, main culprits who generate most of the carbon dioxide don't want to get into that. However, the fight to reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is one of the efforts that has been made by the country, small island states, to address this issue. Additionally, we are trying to cope with our agricultural changes. We are going into different crops. We are also looking at tourism and those uh, diversified our tourism now so that you don't really depend totally on North American tourism, but we are looking more into island exchange and all that kind of stuff. So there are things that we can do. There are things we are doing, but um, how much success we are having at this point is difficult to say. But we need to keep trying. We can't just say, well, it's all overwhelming and give up on it, right? Uh, if we don't, then we'll die. So we have to keep going. Because of the increased concrete, increased asphalt in our city environment, we have what you call um, heat islands. In that if you walk to Kingston in the afternoon after the hot day, you can actually feel the heat radiating from the concrete structures. What the forest or urban forest does is helps to cool the environment, helps to bring that cooling impact in. We're here sitting in, standing in the botanical gardens and you can feel the effect of the trees around us in terms of the cool atmosphere. If we introduce trees in strategic areas and help to continue to uh, make Kingston a little bit more green, it will help to reduce those extreme temperatures. Also it, also it impacts in terms of the cooling uh, rainfall that we may get periodically during the day because of the role that the, the, the forest does in cooling our cities and in helping to, to bring a better environment. One of the concerns is with these Increased temperatures globally, you will have a lot of people impacted by heat strokes and so on. But if you have that cooling environment in, in, in town, it will reduce that impact. Also, our dependence on air conditioners. If we have uh, design our buildings and our, our city in a way that we can have the cooling imp impact of the breezes and the trees, we'll have to we reduce our energy consumption. And we want to make um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, not only a vegetation green island but an energy green island what are some of the the the, the things that small communities i, I come from a, a fishing community it's a small community and we try to do our part in coastal cleanups and education and so what, what else can we do no you you were talking about food a while ago that is a great thing we can do you come from fishing community if people understand that you don't go out there and fish for the very small fish you know and you try you stop taking the very small fish. It might mean reduction in catch for a little while, but it can mean increase in, in the long run. So we need to improve our fishing practices, the, the methodology we use and um, the, the size fish we take. We can address that. Our food the cultivation, we can move out all the ornaments we have, the ornamental things we have, taking our space and start growing productive foods. I mean, I'm thinking of vegetables in small volumes in our backyard. When I was a little guy growing up, my grandparents, we hardly bought anything because nobody walked out of the house. So you have a, a bunch of bananas, you share with everybody in the village. We go to Pulsane in the morning and it gives fish to everybody around. The idea is we talk about communal life. It might become necessary for us to go back to communal type living where we share more and waste less and where we utilize more of what we have. Start growing more of our own food and stop trying to import all this stuff. It is sad to see how much fast food our people move, use, how much greasy, KFC and whatever else that we, our people bring in and they don't want to eat boiling and you know, hard food anymore. But those are the more healthy things. If we check the, throughout the world, cultures where people retain their old lifestyles, the Japanese, the Indians and in the far countries, they live much longer and much more healthy. Things like cancers and these the, the, um, non-contagious disease that they're seeing now, 
it's part to do with our diet. If we go back to some of these dietary practices, we can save ourselves money, we can save ourselves health, which is money in its own way, and we can improve the environment because we will have so much thing to throw away, so much plastic in the environment and that kind of stuff. So we can do some things from the communal level to really address climate change and our life on a whole. When we come back, we speak with Chairman of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Reparations Committee and a shocking move by a university in the United Kingdom. Stay with us. Our natural history includes the long-tailed white tropic birds that migrate to our skies and rock faces, the North Atlantic humpback whale that comes to our warm waters to give birth to and nurse their young, the critically endangered hawksbill turtle and the St. Vincent parrot, these are all creatures that the National Trust seeks to protect for future generations. For more than 40 years, the National Trust has worked to save St. Vincent and the Grenadines' most beloved places, landscapes and seascapes where great moments of history took place. We work together with communities to value and protect important pieces of our cultural community, national history and environment, such as the series of decorated Salvador pots found in Clear Valley, signifying that St. Vincent's civilization is almost 2,000 years old. We do this all because the next generation needs to know our stories, as they will only inherit the places and species we choose to save today. We urge you to plant a tree under whose shade you never plan to sit. Join the National Trust today. We are here with Mr. Jomo Thomas and he's chairman of St. Vincent and the Grenadines Reparations Committee. And we're going to be discussing the issue of reparation and its relevance to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Welcome to our program, Mr. Thomas. Thank you so much. I'm delighted. I'm always delighted. <laughs> okay, let's start first by discussing, talking about um, reparations. What is reparations? Well, reparations plainly mean to repair and you're repairing something that is damaged, something, some pe someone who's wronged gets reparations. It's like just compensation for an injury. And reparations is an international concept that goes towards attempting to repair the damage, the wrong, which have been wrongs, which have been committed against certain people. The most classic case of reparations in recent time, that certainly in the, in, in, in the 21st century, has to do with reparations that Jewish people got because of the years they spent in the Nazi concentration camps, the damage that they suffered, the properties that were confiscated from them during the period of the, of the Third Reich rule over not only Germany, but in many parts of Europe. So across the world, more and more people are asserting their rights, they're declaring that they have been wronged and international society governments have been paying. The Jewish people benefit tremendously, well the state of Israel benefits tremendously from reparations even to this day. Germany, Austria, the United States make tremendous contribution, contributing to the billions of dollars to the state of Israel all because of the guilt which like in the United States they feel and certainly the guilt that the Germans particularly felt for being the ones, the state, that perpetuated that serious injury against Jewish people. It is estimated over six million of them were killed. So that's the context within which, but that's the recent thing. You would know that this year marks 500 years since the transatlantic slave trade, the direct transatlantic trade, trade, slave trade, essentially from about 1445 until like about um, 1518, a lot of people, Africans who were captured and enslaved, went to Europe and then they came over, but mainly to Spain and Portugal. But beginning in about 1518, you had the direct flights, I mean, the direct flights, <laughs> you had the direct journey um, straight across the Atlantic to the Americas, to North America, South America, the Caribbean. So this concept of reparations for people of African descent who were brought here under slavery, it, 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 it's not hollow, something that we should push forward with? Well, we definitely should. In the same way in which Jewish people say never again, African people should say never again. Look, 
I, if you want to go on my Facebook page, I posted yesterday or the day before a simulation of the more than 15,000 ships, shipments over the 318 years of African people being captured, enslaved, and brought over. Uh, so more than 15,000 voyages of uh, estimated 12 million African people. And that's at the low end. 12 million African people were brought over to, quote unquote, the new world. Uh, the estimate is that over 1.5 million died on the journey coming over. So if Jewish people suffered essentially, let's say, between 1933 and 1945, in the, the period when the Third Reich, Hitler and the Third Reich developed, and then they were crushed in, in, at the end of the Second World War in 1945. If over 12 years, they are making a claim for the destruction, the debt, the torture, the turmoil, the pain, the suffering of six million Jews, and, and I'm not trying to minimize this in the least, um, what can African people claim over three centuries, more than 12 million people trans transshipped, more than 1.5 dying in the voyage over, and we're not yet talking about the scores of thousands, the hundreds of thousands that were killed who resisted the enslavement. So it's, a, it's millions, a monumental, uh, um, that is the original Holocaust, if you were to ask me. But when people talk about the Holocaust, they talk about Jewish Holocaust, or they simply say the Holocaust to mean the Jewish Holocaust. But the African Holocaust is the quintessential, I, 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 there's no other people in the history of mankind who has suffered as much in the last 500, 700 years as African people. Right? And in St. Vincent's and the St. Vincent Grenadines' case, it's not only for um, enslavement of Africans, but we also have our indigenous persons. Precisely, precisely. And the good thing about the colonialists is that they kept very good records. So we know for sure that we, and we have said this all across the region, all of the international for, for where we would have attended, that we have a clear case for genocide against the indigenous people, and we also have a clear case for the enslavement of African people. We know that the British came. We know that when they finally captured, conquered St. Vincent, in after the, the, the death of Paramount Chief Joseph Chatelier, one of the first things they did was to map St. Vincent and the Grenadines. They concluded that we had about 100,000 acres. They said all of the land belonged to them. They sold some off, they give it to certain general military men who helped to destroy our people. We know that after 1797, they captured like about 5,000 of our people. They shipped them over to Baliso. Incidentally, the Baliso is an island that they themselves said that not even a lizard can survive there. Our people went there, we spent about three to six months there. About 50% of all of those who went there died in that short period. So St. Vincent and Grenadines has a really strong case. Very, very strong case. Very, very strong case. We have two distinct cases that we can easily make. One on genocide for the indigenous people and certainly the enslavement of African people. I was reading just last week that a university, I think the University of Glasgow in the United Kingdom um, admitted, well, apologized for yes. slavery firstly and then um, is willing to pay reparations yes. to the Caribbean. What yes. does this mean for us? Well, it, it's a significant development, but a lot of these things go under the radar, as we say, because this is not the first university to say that, and I'll, I'll, I'll delineate, delineate some of them. But Glasgow is significant because the president of Glasgow, who has been there for a few years now, Glasgow University, has said that Glasgow must be a university of excellence and a university of justice. And most presidents of universities are concerned with excellence. And when they did their research, they found that slavers, plantation owners in the Caribbean, across the Caribbean, with many of them in Jamaica, had made contributions to Glasgow University in its incipient budding stages that if we translate into today's dollars, it would be about 200 million pounds, all right? And 
The story that we saw that got coverage initially, that Glasgow is willing to pay reparations in 200 million pounds, was a little misleading. It was a misleading headline by the Jamaica Gleaner. What Dr. Beckles, the chairman of the Caribbean Reparations Commission, a really outstanding public intellectual who has done enormously good work on this issue, has had an engagement with a lot of European universities, including Glasgow, including Hull, and in that engagement, in that discussion, in that conversation, he has gotten the president of the university and the university to agree that they did the study, they found that they have benefited significantly from slavery, and they are willing to give you some of that money, probably use all of it, because now they are well endowed, they, they are much more than 200 million, they, they, they are willing to use some of that money to reparate justice work in the Caribbean. So some of the things that we, we could see is contributions to the University of the West Indies. There's going to be a UWI, Glasgow University Center of study, that studies um, non-communicable diseases. Because one of the things that we have noticed in the, in the reparation work is that, and it has been traced all the way back to slavery, the slavery diets, that people in the Caribbean have higher incidence of diabetes, hypertension and uh, pulmonary um, 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 cardiac uh, um, issues and problems and so on. And the evidence is that it, it comes from out of the diet that we had. You know, we, we, we got to eat the instrals of the, of the, of the, the cow and the, the pig. And because in those days you did not have refrigeration, the, 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 the pres preservative was salt. A lot of salt was used mainly for the um, slave diet. For, for a long time, we produced sugar, so sugar was used. And that has now reflected in, in, in many of the ailments and the difficulties and problems that we are having. So that institute is to study that to see how we can, we can, we can, we can so, come so up with it. So genetically, health-wise, that is important? Yes, the yes, disease. yes. Because, and that's what the research is showing now, too that trauma, no matter where and when, can be transmitted through the genes. So people who went through horrible conditions may encode both the resistance to and the susceptibility to, 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 to trauma and horror. And sometimes we see it play, playing itself out. This may be reflected in, some, in the ways in some of our, where our young men behave. We see it in people amidst great odds surmounting those odds and performing at extraordinarily level extraordinary level so that's what that's that's what we see in this so, so this development is important with Glasgow but as I was saying one of the things that has happened as well is that a number of other universities Etna but before I go before I, I go to Etna let me talk about Georgetown University in Washington DC Georgetown University has done a similar research to, to Glasgow, Georgetown found that there was a time when Georgetown University owned enslaved Africans as chattel. They have now come up with a program where they are committed to educate the ancestors of those persons whom they had for the next educate them at Georgetown University or at any other university of their choice for the next 50 years. So this is all a trickle. Uh, uh, Holly University has done a lot of research so they have, uh, have tracked all of the slave, the, the, the slave ships that has brought over all of the Africans. So we now have the records of every save, single slave ship, where it went to, how many people, persons it brought. We know now all of the enslaved Africans who came to St. Vincent or St. Lucia, Jamaica, because of that pioneer, pioneering kind of work. So things are, things are moving ahead because part of it is to build consciousness. We say all the time that while we may never get the, the billions of dollars, if our people can reclaim their minds, if our people can know that, look, I am somebody as, as, as um, Nettleford says that there's, there's a somebody-ness about us. Yeah? 
that we could we, 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 we could we could feel proud of ourselves we don't have a problem with our thick lips and our blackness and our nose and our hair I mean we went through the whole syndrome of, of, of picky head the worst thing you could tell a young woman is she had picky and now we, I'm sitting next to a young woman who <laughs> cut all of her hair off and proudly proclaim well look here I am you know if we can do that that's an amazing amazing advancement and to show that we are making great progress is that when I look around St. Vincent or I look around the Caribbean, I happen to travel a fair amount. We have more conscious sisters now than even in the Black Power era. Adults with short hair, adults with afro, adults with dreadlocks, adult, you know what I mean? Adults with bald head. Can you imagine 40 years ago, a black woman with a bald head? And all of this is happening now. And some of it may be style, but part of the style is an, admi is an admission that you are proud of who you are and you are accepting who you are for who you are. And that is that's a fundamental um, um, uh, leap forward. So I am exceedingly optimistic about the way this is going. So, so can you say that the movement towards or the whole reparations movement, it's not only for us to reclaim what was owed to us, but it's also coming to terms for us to know ourselves yes in, in, that, that's to me that's fundamentally what it is for us to know ourselves you know it says um if you know who you are you have won half of the battle already if you if you are drawing in self-hate and self-pity you can't get out of that to begin to assert yourself and to begin to be positive role models for your children, for your neighbors, for your community, for your country. Once we know ourselves, we are, we are on our way. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Thanks for staying with us. As this country prepares to celebrate nine mornings, Cultural Officer Michael Peters looks back at some other traditions which makes Vincent Christmas the best. For Vincentians born in the 1950s up to the mid-80s, Christmas celebration in this country was much different from what obtains today. To get a glimpse into how Christmas was celebrated back then, I spoke with the chairman of the National Christmas and Nine Mornings Committee, Michael Peters. Christmas was always a, a very special time of the year. Now, I was born in the 60s, so I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and I think um, my generation was the last generation to really have fun. We, we had the best of times. When it, when it came to Christmas, it was a very special time. You know, I, I grew up in a rural, St. Vincent, um, so it was a poor neighborhood, but Christmas didn't matter how much money you have, you saved up all year to have something for Christmas. And, and as, a, as a little boy, one of the things that impressed me most is that Christmas brought everybody together. Um, so that, uh, for example, on Christmas Day, you went from house to house. Fortunately for me, my house was at the end of the street. <laughs> so by the, the time the guys and girls reached by me, everybody would be drunk. But you had to eat something, you had to drink something. It, it, um, it was aerated water, soda, that we had in those days. We didn't have malts as yet, it was just soft drinks. And the soft drinks was aerated water sold by the Nobrigal. So you went from house to house, and um, every house you had to have black cake and ham and fruit cake and, you know, ginger beer, sorrel to serve the, the visitors and so it was it was a festive occasion. Now on Christmas morning, the boys in the village, we would play cowboys and Indian. You know, we would make our own guns because you couldn't afford to buy guns. Or even if you could afford to buy guns, there was these little guns and there was a store in town called Bruce O'Bonnety that used to sell these, what we call them, shots, was on a roll. So you had this little gun, you put the shots in, and then you just press the trigger and went pow, pow, pow. And we were playing cowboys and Indians for the entire Christmas morning. So by the time you got to midday, 
you would have been running up and down in the Hudson and, and, and playing. So you're hungry now. And the Christmas lunch was, was the lunch. There's, that's the time of day you got at least two or three meats on your plate. You, you have to have your, your chicken, you have to have your beef or your pork, and then your ham on that plate with stroopies and rice and vegetables. So it was a sumptuous lunch. Most of us from going house to house, we couldn't even eat what was on the plate. Right? It's, it's really Boxing Day that you ate at home because you go, you're visiting all your friends. It's really on Boxing Day that you ate your home lunch. But it was a very sumptuous occasion. Serenading, which involved going from house to house, making music and singing carols, making speeches and collecting money, cake or drink, was another aspect of the Christmas celebration here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. A tradition which, according to Peters, has died. Serenading was fun because, you know, we serenaded not just for entertainment, but uh, for fundraising. That's how we got money for Christmas. We made our own instruments, you know, you, you got an old paint pan, you put some newspapers over it, you, you use a, a, a ripe breadfruit to paste, to stick the paper over the pan, and you had two pieces of stick and you were making music with these paint pans. You practice, you know, the boys in the village, we got together, we practice. No, you had to practice a speech, right? Because when, when you got to the house, you expected, first of all, to give a speech, sing a carols, and then you ended off. Um, and, you know, people were expecting you then, right? So the house was always open, ready for serenaders to pass by. And, you, you know, you went from house to house serenaded. Sometimes you got a 25 cents or 10 cents, whatever. 10 cents had value back in the 60s, <laughs> tremendous value, so it, it added up. Or you got a piece of cake, or you got some, something to drink. But serenading was fun. Just sometimes some people felt that uh, if you weren't good enough, they would have they had some night, 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 you ring out waiting for you <laughs> to throw the window. <laughs> Right, or, or, or some people, you know, you, you might be passing by too late and the people through the curtains and they see the closing of the door and turning yeah. off the lights, right? <laughs> but it, it was fun going house to house. And what would Christmas in St. Vincent and the Grenadines be without nine mornings? A tradition that is unique to SVG and which, according to Peters, died in the 1980s. However, through the efforts of the Department of Culture, was resurrected in the late 1990s. So by the time we got to our teenage years, all of that had, had stopped. You know, the, the early getting up early in the morning, going my sardine bakery and getting the early morning bread and cakes. All the sardine bakery had, you know, basically the cease operations. So Vincentians no longer were coming out. The nine morning tradition had died. So when to restart it, you had to have structured activities to get people to come out. Um, being Vincentians, we still, that getting up early morning was still in us. So once you had structured activities, that is what brought people back out to nine mornings. And starting in 1989, the Department of Culture um, started that particular process um, that has led to where we are um, in 2018. Nine mornings now is these early morning structure activities, be the street concerts, um, you know, that you have in the various villages or, or, or different competitions and all the sort of stuff. That is where Nine Mornings is. The tradition has remained the same, getting up early in the morning. But the activities have changed to these structured street concerts that where people gather. So in St. Vincent now, it is, it's a big thing, but it has evolved over a long period of time. So it is no longer spontaneous, it's more organized now. And to keep it going, we had to organize and structure it. The 2018 Christmas Festival will launch this Sunday, December 2nd. And according to Peters, it will be a launch with a difference. The program itself starts at 6 o'clock. We start with a traditional street parade that has traditional music, police band, cadet band, boom drum, string band, steel band, pan around the neck. Um, and then we have what is like mini floats this year. Um, we have a whole lot of dancers, we have a whole lot of dramatists. So they will be part of the parade with their, you know, different floats and what's not, and their lights. And um, we have brought in a number of lights for that. So it's going to look really spectacular. Then we have all these community groups, you know, coming down and doing their own thing. We're bringing their own music, some with bottle and spoon, some with boom jump, you know, and we, we're going around town. 
that, that parade is always symbolic. It's, it's a parade of lights, and lights is, is, is one of the symbols of peace. And we really need peace in, in, in our country as our country battles with all kinds of social um, problems. Following the, the street parade, you know, we go to Heritage Square. It starts at Heritage Square, goes around town, and ends up at Heritage Square. When we come back to Heritage Square, we light up the square. And people like to see lights. The light, lighting up has become a part of the Christmas celebration in St. Vincent where the village and communities light up. So we're going to light up Heritage Square. Last year we did something extra. This year we're doing something a little extra again at Heritage Square, making it look as spectacular as possible. Then following the, the lighting up, we have a, a Christmas concert. And within the Christmas concert is the community concert where the various communities come and sing and compete and talk about Christmas in the various villages and, and, and towns across St. Vincent. And this year we, we're seeing the return of one of our major Christmas artists, um, C.P. Hall. Mm -hmm. C.P. is coming back and I know people always look forward to C.P. He is coming back this year. So it's going to be a, a really good launch, Sunday the 2nd. Jennifer Richardson for Inside Story. Community Beat is up next. Stay with us. Protecting our marine environment. Our forests, our wildlife for our children. Pollution of our rivers and beaches. Deforestation and overfishing threaten to destroy our biodiversity. Protected areas are set aside by law to protect these fragile ecosystems which provide us with water, food, electricity and recreation. Tobago Keys Marine Park, Kingsville Forest Reserve and Milligan Key Wildlife Reserve are examples of our local protected areas. Be inspired and help preserve what is naturally ours. Let's Protected areas protect life. A message from the Environmental Management Department and the National Parks, Rivers and Beaches Authority. So we're here with Melissa Patterson and she's a designer. She does purses, necklaces, clutches, just about anything. Tell us how you became involved in this field of work. Okay. Um, it started in 2010 when I lost my first job. Um, I was home for about a year or so. And I was home. I, ha I used to wear a lot of jewelry. I'd buy a lot of local jewelry from those people on the street. And then I had them home, this piece been break up, that piece been break up, I had to go and carry them for fix, charge a little five dollars here and there, and they home playing with them and just trying to put together. Um, my kid's father, he had um, pliers, so they go in his toolbox, <laughs> took up the pliers and start putting pieces together. And then I got another job, and while I was there, it's like, um, there was a young lady outside who was selling. And I used to pass the lunchtime, look at her stuff. You know, I was like, I could do that too. You know, I could do that too. And then I start doing bits and pieces, buying um, jewelry. When I buy the jewelry, break them up, put on this piece, put on this piece, inquire where I could find the hooks and well, buy the craft shops. And this way it started and start making them. So, yeah, that's, that's how it started. <laughs> <laughs> sewing. Mm -hmm. I was like sewing. Yeah. Um, I must give him credit. Um, my kid's father had a sewing machine, right? We had bought some um, fabric cloth 
to make um and all of us <laughs> a fabric to make um curtains for the house and we wanted somebody to sew so we couldn't find nobody and he said i could do it i said i mean you could do it he said my mother is his son she have a machine so i he lie on from she and he brought the machine and he sewed the curtains and then he tried to teach me to use it, it was those old singer pedal i couldn't use it uh, but a year or so after um he bought him a different machine which was this machine the first one that gave me problem problem now and i he teach me to use it, but when he was teaching me, he was also teaching me how to drive at the same time too. So he said, when you mash it, mash it like when you're mashing the gas, how you, how you press it is how it go, go fast. So, so I start sewing bits and pieces from there and then I took up a course, a sewing course um, with Cassandra. I did well in that class and the sewing went there and then I used to go on YouTube to see how to do certain things and I bought up on clutch bosses and that. So it was kind of accidentally I bought up on clutch bosses and then I start trying it out. I should say the year's history. <laughs> <laughs> and then by making them and then into the jewelry, I wanted to do something different. Everybody making jewelry, but I just wanted to do something different, you know. I wanted to stand out. So I start saying the clutch purse will look nice with the matching necklace. So I start taking the fabric. Now, I did my little research how to do them too. So I was basically self-taught by the internet. So and how has business been been doing because these are these are very impressive well it's it have a time okay yeah. um <coughs> do you work outside of this or do you do this i used to time? i used to i used to i lost my job um recently just before school opened which is uh, september the 31st mm -hmm. the 30th the friday just before school opened but it, it had been a blessing because while i was working i didn't have time for this you know, I couldn't market myself properly either. So I have this. So it's been it's been a blessing. Okay. How do you market your products? Um, I'm on Facebook and on Instagram, and I normally look forward to exhibitions. When I get exhibition, yeah, I love exhibitions. I love love to interact with the customers. I feel good. I feel come they give me a little compliments. I look nice. You know, build up myself, build up my self esteem too. So. So you get a little plug there. Yes. And then you'll be participating next week in the Everything, Everything Beauty Expo. Yes. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that? Excited. Excited. I'm looking forward to it because I was told there outside exhibitors coming into as well and there will be buyers. So I'm hoping that there, that will be an open window for me as well. So I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. How far do you intend to reach with your business? Um, I want it to be my sole income. Right, I want to probably get a store, a shop, or something. Yeah. I want to be that to be it for me. So, what's your brand? Your brand name? Oh, my name. <laughs> name of the business. It's Abenance Creation. Abenance Creation. It's named after my daughters, my two daughters, Abigail and Anisia. Yeah. Abenance Creation. <laughs> okay. Um. Do you have like, repeat customers coming to you? Yeah, yeah, yes, I do. But they are more into the, the earrings, the paper earrings. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned that you also do paper jewelry. Paper jewelry. Yes. Let me bring it one thing. This. How, how did this is the you? local newspaper. Please local newspaper this particular ones and these are gift papers and I'm recently working on some independent I'm going one the independence yeah okay so you just explore our different avenues of using mm -hmm. materials yes. <laughs> some I walk on the ground sometimes I walk on the ground depending or I clay here and I use the um the box cutter Mm -hmm. Yeah, put it on a piece of cardboard and just zzz, use my daughter um ruler and just zzz, pull it down. <laughs> so you cut plenty, just pull it down. And then the newspapers are very fragile, though. Mm. Very, very, very fragile. So you have to use like about about three, three, four, five piece something to get it this thick and to get it hold. And these I use like about two. This one is three, so it depends. It depends. Yeah. Okay. What would you say is your 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 best seller? Um, paper earrings. <laughs> really? Paper earrings. <laughs> paper earrings. 
So you, you cut the... You cut them in strips, roll them, and coat them. I have a little secret. Oh, okay. Yes, keep your little secrets. <laughs> so you basically use most of the raw materials available yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also start doing the, um, I call it snack and reuse. That is the snack packs. I, I recently introduced, um, I call it, as I said, snack and reuse. You know, the can call paper that mm -hmm. people, the throw kids away. throw away. Yeah, so I turn them into paws. So you can use them as coin paws, pencil case, you know. This is very crazy. It's a good way of reusing material, yeah. uh, materials, recycling, so to speak. <laughs> I'm sure the children must love these. Yes. When I had the exhibition at the public library and they was like, Wow, this this is a pause. I think of something to eat. Oh and I open it and try to explain to them and say, Wow, I can tell mommy, I can tell mommy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were amused. Okay. So tell us how can people get in contact with you? Um you can find me on Facebook at Abanance Creation on Instagram and on telephone number 526-1029 and I'm also upstairs the first floor the vegetable market at K5 stall. Okay. I just like to see the complete set. They have any you know, nice bracelet, they have any earring, a necklace, and a clutch post. I don't know, I just like to see a nice complete set. Okay. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. This is my board. This board is about uh, five five years old. That was a necklace. Some of this stuff I like stuff I make week walking. I made this last night. Really? Yeah, yeah, I made this last night. But the beads them just take like about a two, three days to make. Okay. Yeah, because what coat them with, they take like about twenty four hours to dry. So I do the beads them in already make, but to assemble the necklace, mm -hmm. I made them last night. Yeah, this is what I started out with these beads. Mm -hmm. You know, buy them and break them up or make them as you say you were in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is how I started out with. But as I said, I just wanted to do something different. Everybody making necklace, but I want to just do something different. Make your product stand out. Yes. having too much salt in it. Can I have a fruit, please? That's an interesting choice. But where did you learn that? The people on Hellwood. No, Mommy. You want to kill me with high blood pressure? Hellwood says whatever salt you eat for the whole day should not be more than one teaspoon. And that is just for adults, you know. Foods may contain more salt than you think. Reduce salt intake. Golden apple, commonly called goling or june plum, is a sweet, juicy fruit with a yellowish green exterior. The fruit is abundant in the islands of the Caribbean and the Pacific territories. Here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, golden apples, whether green or ripe, are eaten with salt and pepper, used to make juice or used in a fruit salad. The juice is said to be in the national drink of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Golden apples are high in vitamin C, potassium, iron, and studies show it helps to treat digestive problems, ulcers, and helps to regulate the thyroid gland. It also boosts immunity and helps to relieve morning sickness during pregnancy. Golden apples can be eaten skin and all, though that may have a slightly sweet, sour taste. Some people like that though. While others prefer to peel a golden apple and eat. Bite into a sweet golden apple today.
Thanks for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Remember, Inside Story is a production of the Agency for Public Information. Feel free to interact with us. You can view our programs online on API's Facebook page or send us an email at insidestory.api at gmail.com. I'm Nadia Slater. I'll see you next week.